Right, good morning everybody um, and welcome to our report launch this morning, uh, How Far and How Fast Public Debt After the Pandemic. I'm uh, Ian Mulhern and I'm the Executive Director for UK Policy here at TBI. Uh, now, many of you would have heard last week the ONS saying that economic activity was down around 25% on normal uh, during the depths of the economic great pause. And as a result, tax revenues are tanking, uh, emergency measures are in, in full swing. Um, and uh, the, the impact on, deficit, on deficits and debt is, is going to be huge. And uh, those, those uh, figures are ballooning. And we're also only at the start of what's going to, what's increasingly looking like will be quite a long uh, recovery. Uh, so how high will <clears throat> the tide of red ink go? Uh, and how worried should we be? Uh, well, my colleague uh, James Brown has some answers for us in the report that we're launching uh, today. Uh, and in a moment, James will take us through the headline findings. Uh, and then we'll move to uh, hear from a fantastic panel of speakers uh, to chew over those findings. We have uh, Professor Linda Yu of Oxford University, uh, a professor at the London Business School and at the LSE. And Linda is also the author of a recent book, The Great Economists. Uh, we will also hear then from Vicky Price, uh, an economic consultant and former head of the Government Economic Service. Uh, and we'll hear from Tim Pitt, a former advisor to uh, both Philip Hammond and Sajid Javid, uh, and now a partner at Flint Global. Um, but first, James will take us through the headline messages, and then we'll uh, come to the panel for some, for some reaction. Uh, and then finally, at the end, towards the end of the hour, which will be a packed hour, I'm sure, we, we will uh, hopefully be able to open up for a Q&A session with uh, those of you on the call. Uh, now, many of you will be familiar with how these sessions work by now, but um, we have a Q&A box in the, at the bottom of your screen. Please do uh, type questions as they come into your head, as you're hearing from uh, the panelists as we go along, and I will come to you to unmute you um, uh, when it comes to the Q&A uh, section. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, and to move things on as quickly as possible, James, I'll hand over to you to take us uh, through the findings of the report. Great, thanks Ian. Um, so, we've seen some remarkable economic statistics over the last few weeks. We've seen GDP down 25% in just a couple of months. More than a quarter of employees are currently being paid by the government through the job retention scheme. And just today we saw unemployment uh, at levels we haven't seen for many, many years. Um, given the unprecedented nature of the government support package uh, for the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it's already very clear that uh, deficits this year are gonna be very large and that will come out uh, of the pandemic with a much higher level of public debt than we expected just a few months ago. Uh, we saw a flavour of um, what's to come in April when tax revenues were down 42% on the previous year and spending 52% higher. Indeed, we saw a high, with a higher deficit in just that single month uh, than in the whole of the previous year. Is this sustainable? Well, on the one hand, it comes at a time when we'd expect significant pressure on the public finances anyway from the cost of an ageing population. But on the other hand, the good news is that the government can uh, borrow at very low interest rates at the moment. Uh, they can borrow for 10 years at a rate of less than 0.3%. So we can lock in um, very low rates on a lot of this debt for quite a long time. In the report, we look at what's likely to happen to the public finances going forward. And we look at a number of different scenarios. Uh, we look at three different scenarios for how long social distancing requirements have to remain in place. Uh, but in all of them, what we see this year is uh, eye-watering deficit levels greater than we saw uh, during the height of the global financial crisis. Um, and at the same time, a big jump in uh, debt as a share of national income, most likely going above 100% uh, of national income by the end of this year. But what happens after this? Well, if fully recovers, so by 2025, it's the same size as we expected it would be in March, a debt falls pretty quickly as a share of national income, even with under unchanged tax and spending policies. 
uh, with the government running a deficit of about two or two and a half percent of the national income. There's certainly not a need for large budget surpluses to repay this additional debt. Even under the worst case scenario uh, we examine, debt falls below 100% uh, of national income by about 2040 in this scenario. But that's a big if. If instead the economy is permanently reduced in size in line with what's happened in previous recessions, we see tax revenues lower and deficits higher. Uh, debt still falls as a share of national income in the recovery phase when growth is very fast, but without any change to tax or spending plans, it then starts increasing again. But even then, uh, the debt to GDP ratio does stabilize, albeit at relatively high levels of between 100 and 200 percent of national income. So this suggests we should worry a lot more about the scale of long term damage to the economy than about the debts we're running up during this acute phase of the crisis. If we need to borrow more to minimize the damage, that would be better than tightening prematurely and exacerbating long-term economic damage. Moreover, even with the very high debt levels we saw in the previous charts, extremely low interest rates mean that debt interest payments remain surprisingly affordable if interest rates remain so low. Remarkably, debt interest payments will take up a lower share of tax revenues than they did last year under all the scenarios we look at, a long way below the levels we saw in uh, the 1980s and previous decades. Should we be worried, uh, should we be relaxed about these very high levels of debt then? Well, one reason to be worried is that high levels of debt leave us um, very vulnerable to increases in interest rates. If interest rates started rising from 2025 to hit historically normal levels by 2040, uh, debt interest payments would start to rise rapidly, taking up a large and larger share of revenues, quickly going above the levels we saw in the post-war period. And this would make uh, debt to GDP ratios start rising very quickly, putting the public finances on an unsustainable path. So it would be a dangerous gamble to assume that interest rates will remain low forever. Once the economy has recovered, therefore the government should seek to put the debt to GDP ratio on a downwards path. Unfortunately, the government's current fiscal rules don't offer the uh, opportunity to respond flexibly. Instead, they require uh, a sharp fiscal tightening to balance the current budget within three years. And in the worst case scenario we look at, this would require a faster pace of austerity than we saw during the 2010s. Now, of course, it's highly unlikely the government would actually uh, do this in this scenario, more likely it would ditch uh, its current fiscal rules. But this would leave us with damaging uncertainty just at the time it would be most needed. In previous work, some of my colleagues have suggested an all-weather fiscal framework that would allow a more optimal response. And I go into more detail in the reports, uh, but under a framework, there's an escape clause that allows fiscal consolidation to wait until the economy has recovered from the pandemic. Uh, but then the government would have to ensure that public sector net worth is increasing over time. Also, to ensure debt doesn't go too high, there's a deficit limit um, that, that adjusts depending on the interest rates on government debt, which would allow the government to borrow more to invest when interest rates are low. Given the really low interest rates we have at the moment, this would allow borrowing of up to 3.6% of GDP to, for investment, 20% more than under current government plans. But this limit would start to reduce if interest rates started to rise. And that would put debt to GDP uh, on a downward path. So to sum up, we don't need to worry about the debt that we're, that's being run up in this acute phase of crisis but we should try and minimize any long-term damage from the pandemic, and in the longer term, to reduce debt as a share of national income to protect against higher interest rates. Back to you, Ian. Thanks, James. You did really well to rattle through the, the huge amount of content in the report, so um, so hopefully people can take their time to go and have a look through it. Um, but yeah, so in short, don't worry about the short term uh, and don't gamble in the long term. 
uh, that's uh, the kind of message that comes through fr from your from your work. Um, let's go, Vicky, uh, first to you um, to get your your take on that. Thank you very much, and, and thank you, James, for this. I, I think uh, we're all in in general agreement. I, I'd guess that um, it makes sense not to go for austerity, certainly not in the short to medium term, and there's some very good reasons for it. I mean, the economy couldn't stand it. Uh, the public wouldn't accept cuts in public services of the types that we saw, of course, in the previous austerity period. Um, and, uh, and basically the economy would collapse anyway pretty quickly. So uh, the interesting thing about the whole COVID situation is that it has changed perceptions of what a sustainable debt level can be. And I think that's good news generally. I mean, do remember that uh, to join the euro, you had to have just 60% debt to GDP ratio as a maximum. Of course, we know full well that very many countries are way above it. And the figures that James was talking about between 100 and 200 percent, well, they've been well known in the Eurozone for some time. But there are other countries, too, such as Japan, uh, for example, that have lived with that for a lot longer. And the other interesting thing is that if you look at the IMF uh, calculations originally, and that's one of the reasons why, of course, they were so strict with places like Greece, uh, was that they believed that 90 percent was the sustainable uh, rate beyond that. Uh, the capital market just wouldn't lend to you and the interest rate you'd have to pay would just not be met by growth in the economy and then you default so there's been a change in that and of course we have loads and loads of countries all around the world which are doing similar things to what we're doing and i guess they're not intending to cut back in 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 a hurry and we've been hearing that even in the us they're now thinking of an extra uh one trillion coming in and helping the economy further so it's not as if the help uh, is there and then the question is how you unwind it uh, the issue is still the number of countries that more help is due to come and we may well get the same thing uh, happening uh, here uh, but the interesting thing of course is that the reason for it and the reason why countries like the UK have been able to borrow as cheaply as James is outlining is because we have a central bank behind us which is prepared to lend uh, the government practically by just uh, uh, engaging in quantitative easing in a very, very big way. That's happening everywhere where there is a central bank which uh, is there standing ready to assist this fiscal spending that's taking place. The Bank of England itself, of course, has already extended its QE by 200 billion and it's likely this week to extend it by a further 100, maybe another 150 billion to match almost exactly the 350 or so billion that the government will have to borrow this year alone. And the markets don't really worry hugely about fiscal rules. James was talking about changing them a little bit. They've been very, very used to uh, fiscal rules just being abandoned uh, or at least sort of changing a little bit with each different chancellor. Uh, and they've accommodated that pretty well. And they've also been quite happy to lend to us because of this Bank of England uh, you know, backing, um, despite the fact we've had a number of downgrades. So we were downgraded at the time of the financial crisis. We were downgraded again as a country uh, just when we voted for Brexit. We were downgraded again at the beginning of COVID. And when the crisis and the size of it was beginning to be realized, we're probably going to be downgraded again, given that uh, we are likely to be the slowest uh, growing country or rather the fastest dropping country in terms of GDP growth of any OECD countries in uh, 2020. And the question, of course, is what happens next? Now, um, that sounds good for the time being. The issue is, is it going to continue uh, being uh, so, uh, so benign in terms of the, the markets? And of course, there are two crucial issues. First of all, Indeed, as James was saying, if interest rates go up and go up significantly at some stage, we will be able to continue to borrow the rate we're doing. Now, uh, the markets may simply not react uh, in any sort of terribly negative way uh, in the short to medium term, given that so many other countries are, are doing similar things. Comparative data will be very important, but of course we will need to produce growth. Uh, and uh, the sustainability argument is that if your nominal uh, GDP growth is higher than the interest you have to pay, then that's fine. You can carry on doing so. But will we get there? Right now, we are, of course, in a decline um, uh, period. Uh, how fast will the recovery be? And will it be sustainable? And that's the second issue. Uh, if we're looking ahead uh, for those uh, new rules, if you like, to uh, at least be seen by the markets as rules that allow flexibility uh, but don't just leave you with very, very high debt-to-GDP ratio forever. Uh, you will need to look at the way in which your economy 
is likely to grow. It's not just, unfortunately, going back to where we were before, because the where we were before uh, was still suggesting quite low growth in the UK economy. And with low growth in the UK economy, remember the Bank of England just before the crisis expected us to grow by just 0.8% this year and maybe 1.2, 1.4% in the years to come uh, until the end of the parliament. Well, that's hardly a sort of ringing endorsement of what the policies were there. There was Brexit, of course, the trade uh, reductions that uh, we've all been experiencing. Uh, there is still the concern about the type of growth that the world economy will move back to and uh, the UK as an open economy at present. Um, is going to depend hugely on that and uh, the IMF may well revise even its very, very pessimistic forecast of minus 3% this year to something even worse uh, when they produce a new forecast in July. Uh, and of course the trade forecasts are pretty dire, expecting anything between 13 and 30% for this year uh, and only a small recovery after. So we're going to be hugely dependent on what happens to the world economies and individual nation therefore to get over to that type of growth that will at least mean uh, that there is some fiscal consolidation that happens naturally and we won't have to, to seriously uh, sort of put the, you know, push the brakes uh, hard, which would be a terrible thing to happen to, to the economy. Uh, we need to think of what type of sustainable growth there may be. So it's not just an issue of macro policies uh, of the sort that are happening now, but it's an issue really really like the bank of england putting money into the economy uh, it's really also an issue of micro how do we get over the period of inequality we're seeing right now how do we merge uh, and try to make up for the even greater inequality we're going to have as we come out how will we emerge with higher productivity uh, which is going to be very very hard to achieve how do we emerge as a competitive nation in the future if we don't achieve those aims and to superimpose the problems of Brexit, uh, then I think those, pro those issues of the high uh, government debt, uh, however flexible the, the new rules might be, would still probably stick, uh, more, the, make the UK uh, be seen to have stuck to a very high debt to GDP ratio that it probably will not be able to control. And if that's the case, then interest rates will start to rise and we may well see uh, growth in the UK economy being uh, seriously constrained for a very long period to come. Thank you. Thanks, Vicky. And Vicky, you, you, you sound very pessimistic on the long run uh, potential growth of the economy. Uh, I, I mean, obviously, the, the relationship between that and public finances is, is a complicated one. But you know, here we're sort of assuming a kind of one and a half percent a year in the long run. Would you say that is a kind of, uh, that's a, a, an over optimistic outlook for the coming couple of decades? One and a half percent a year is pretty poor, I would say. It's not overly optimistic. I'm not suggesting that we're going to be declining every year. In fact, we are probably going to have quite a rebound from a very low base. Uh, the real question is if we don't get back to levels of productivity growth uh, that we had before the financial crisis, uh, then we are stuck with the low growth, high unemployment. And even if we have low uh, unemployment, that the type of employment we've been having recently isn't doing very much for sustainability for the economy because it's been uh, not well rewarded in unproductive sectors with huge support still coming from the public sector to sustain uh, incomes in households because they've been quite poorly paid and the gig economy and the self-employed have actually contributed to a significant drop in productivity since the financial crisis uh, than otherwise have been the case. So we're stuck in a with huge loss of productivity that has happened since the financial crisis. And if we get back to just one and a half percent growth, uh, then I'm afraid we're on a very, very poor trajectory ahead. Okay, great. Uh, Linda, let's go to you next. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, and, um, and great uh, presentation, James. Um, it's lovely to hear Vicky's comments as well. I think um, the first thing I would uh, commend you on, um, your team, is certainly producing um, a fiscal policy framework um, to look at the longer term, because I think this is something which um, does need to be done. There needs to be a debate um, about it. And of course, you know, fiscal rules. Um, there's an interesting thing about parliaments because parliaments can change any law, um, so, and that includes fiscal policy and indeed even monetary policy rules. 
Um, but having some guidance um, is useful. And I think this is a great debate to be having. So I'm going to limit my comments, my initial comments, maybe to just three um, aspects and look forward to the questions from the audience and the discussion. I think um, I'm going to frame my comments around a debt sustainability rule. So think about the cost of borrowing R and the growth rate of the economy. Now, if both of those are the same, um, then essentially your economy grows at the same rate as your level of debt and therefore your debt never increases as a share of GDP. So it's a very rough rule of thumb. Uh, this is how, uh, for instance, rating agencies and markets would view uh, whether or not a country uh, looks, quote, sustainable. Now, it's more complicated than that, but I think as a rule of thumb, it just helps us go through perhaps um, some of the, uh, the issues we need to look at. So I think the very first issue is you've got a range of growth rates for G, and this is linked to how damaging COVID is. So uh, the Bank of England thinks, um, and you outline your report, could be around one and a half percent effect on GDP, but there is a range, uh, three to seven percent. Um, it's uh, worryingly a wider range, but we are in a period of high uncertainty. But I think the key here to avoid a short-term shock like a pandemic from having a long-term growth effect is to avoid hysteresis. So this is when a shock translates a short-term um, hit um, by making people discouraged, they fall the labor market, and that damages the growth potential of the economy. So we've had unemployment figures out today, 3.9% um, of um, which is the same actually um, in the previous February to April period, but vacancies have fallen by a record amount. So what that is suggesting are a number of things, including the job support, which is given in a range of um, schemes, um, is helping uh, keep people um, either attached to the workforce or um, you know, not, just not becoming unemployed. Um, so I want to come back to that because I think um, there's a lot of things we can't control about uh, growth, including what happens with uh, the technology shocks we're living through now. Um, you know, but I think the, um, the focus on trying to avoid hysteresis needs to be quite, um, quite important as a focus of fiscal policy. I want to move to the cost of borrowing. So um, in, the, um, in the report, you cite the OBR's um, expectation that R, the real cost um, guilt rates, um, will be one and a half percent or so. So is there, so if you're trying to, you're not sure about the growth rate, you can't really control the cost of borrowing, um, but the cost of borrowing, at least as it stands currently, um, you know, if we think that the potential growth rate of the economy, according to the OBR, is probably just slightly lower than that at this point, is an argument for locking in the cost of borrowing, um, for instance, through investment. So therefore you have at least uh, one variable that looks like you have some expectation of what your debt servicing costs might be. Um, so obviously your fiscal rules um, allow for that. There's more flexibility for that. And I would um, suggest that um, in order to lock in the rules with some degree of credibility, you need future returns. And this is where the focus on investment, uh, which you do discuss in the report, is so important. And I would probably go a step further and say all fiscal policy is in a sense a statement about what government spending is going to support. So can fiscal policy through increasing investment align um, the government's support goals in the near term with longer term growth goals. So for instance, greening the economy, raising standards of living um, by improving productivity. So this is around being more productive um, during um, social working, social distancing, or all working from home. Are there investments that can also, that can essentially make us more productive and make us greener? And I would include in this investment human capital, not just physical capital, because as I said a moment ago, um, it is actually human capital that makes a massive difference, as we all would, you know, expect um, if we're going to get back to potential. So should there be um, some consideration of and this is obviously a very thorny area, um, are there policies we can learn um, about? And um, for instance, short time work support um, beyond the end um, of the year. And then finally, I think your framework in terms of um, uh, thinking about how it works in operation 
operationally is to have loose fiscal policy until the economy is at its um, full potential. Now, this is not a problem that is unfamiliar to anyone who works in this area. It's a problem everyone grapples with, which is where are we? How do you know what uh, full potential is? The output gap is very difficult to measure when you're going through a period of um, a structural change. So secular stagnation, this expectation that growth rates will be lower in the coming years, all of that has will, you know, could cause um, certainly causes uncertainty, but it may well cause a change in the growth potential um, of the economy. So there are obviously those who are divided between whether or not we are in an Ingalls pause at the moment. So, you know, if you look at the Industrial Revolution, there was a period in which um, the uh, standards of living um, didn't quite catch up with technological progress until about three decades later before everybody gets very worried, times are very different between now and in the, uh, during the first industrial revolution of the 17th and 18th centuries. But what I'm suggesting is, um, this is a, every fiscal policy needs to look at this measure. And it is actually one of the hardest measures. Um, and economists are quite split on whether or not we will have um, technologies that raise uh, productivity. Um, so therefore, um, we don't face secular stagnation and um, we don't need to adjust what the trend growth rate is and then those who are either more optimistic or more pessimistic. So with that uncertain tone, I'll hand back to you, Ian. Thanks, Linda. So, Linda, you mentioned there about um, uh, the possibility of productive investments and you talked about um, uh, particularly the, the environmental challenge that we face. Um, but I wonder how, how confident you are um, that, so obviously we need to rewire the economy for a more sustainable um, uh, world, but is that really the possible, is that really an avenue to higher productivity or do you think this will be at least in the short term a drag on, on, on productivity? How do you kind of, how do you see that? Um, I actually think it could boost productivity. Now I know again, um, the, uh, the evidence I'm looking at is historical. So if you look at um, periods in the, of the in, um, Industrial Revolution, it wasn't always the case that we use fossil fuels. I should probably just say, you mentioned, kindly mentioned my book at the beginning, it covers 250 years of economic history. So I have looked back a lot at, um, um, at history. And there was a time when fossil fuels wasn't even the dominant, um, it wasn't so dominant as it is today. So you, you can have a greener investment um, without necessarily um, impacting standards of living. So remember what I described as Engels' pause. You should never expect a simultaneous effect, but nor should you necessarily expect somehow there's a trade-off between becoming greener and, then, and productivity. Um, and in fact, um, as we think about what we need as a society, um, when I phrase the productivity improvements, I phrase it as improvements in standards of living. It's really quality of life. So um, the definition of what it means to be more productive actually needs to change in line with um, and why this is why I always describe it as standards of living. So, so the answer is I don't. Um, I think there's a switching cost. I feel like a lot of industries, you know, think there's a switching cost. That's true. Um, but given how long it takes for productivity to be increased through any change in innovation, very few innovations immediately bring about this big boost in productivity. Um, I would say, you know, there. Are, I wouldn't worry about too much about that aspect of greening the economy. Okay, great. Um, now, Tim, you've been in or at least near the hot seat uh, for these kind of decisions. So, um, what would you be advising the Chancellor today? <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks, Ian, and, and thanks, James, for an excellent uh, report that I think kicks off a, a really important debate. Now, all the focus at the moment is, is quite understandably on, on the short term fiscal response to this crisis, but I think you do need to have an eye on the long term implications for the public finances, and the Treasury certainly will be. And that's not just because before too long, policymakers are going to have to face up to that long term picture, but because unless we clearly distinguish between the short and long term role for fiscal policy, I, I think we risk falling into traps in, in terms of policy, think, in terms of policy thinking. So uh, confusing being comfortable with really quite extraordinary levels of borrowing in the short term, with a, with a general acceptance that low interest rates mean we never have to worry about deficits again. 
um, uh, and, and also confusing the vital short-term role public spending has in supporting growth with now, in, you know, during the crisis with assuming that uh, the only or even primary way to unlock higher growth in the long term is ever more public spending. So I think the report is a very good way to kick off this uh, debate. Now, in terms of the substance, uh, the thrust of which I very much uh, agree with, there are, there are two points I want to make, one on the projections in the report and then one on the politics of it all. So on the projections, I'm afraid, James, I'm even gloomier than you are on the long-term outlook uh, for the public finances. So you, you, you talk about the two risks in the long term being interest rate rises and obviously the, and, and the increased uh, or the extent of the increased structural deficit that we'll have coming out of, of the crisis. But I think there are two more that make the risks, particularly around interest rate exposure, even higher. And those are the, the long term pressures that were already there on public spending. So from ageing, from rising healthcare costs, from decarbonisation, which, which Linda touched on. Uh, even pre-crisis, the long-term OBR predictions for public debt were for them to start increasing really pretty rapidly from the 2030s uh, and then hit 250% of GDP by 2060. And that's before you factor in any COVID. So you know, that obviously just adds to the problems in your report. And then I think the other thing that you have to factor in is that growth isn't going to smoothly carry on at, you know, 1.5%. You've got to factor in major shocks to the economy. You know, if you look over the last uh, 15 years, we've had two enormous shocks, which is likely to have going to seen our national debt as a proportion of GDP triple, possibly even quadruple. So your long-term projections need to factor in, you know, periodic recessions. Um, uh, so actually get, getting debt down over time or even keeping it stable is, is actually pretty tough. And, and I think it means that in the good times, you do need to get debt on a, on a pretty decent steep downward path. Of course, there's a very fine balancing act with the role fiscal policy has in, in trying to increase trend growth, which obviously Vicky touched on. The, the, the second point I want to make then is around the, the politics, which I think is hugely important to, to the timing, to the scale and to the nature of uh, any consolidation that we will see. So the, the timing, James, you, you argue, and I think quite rightly, that from an economic perspective, you should err on removing support too slowly rather than too quickly. Uh, but the reality is that politics may well push in the other direction. So we've just had a general election, uh, and particularly when it comes to tax rises, if you look at history, it tells us that Tory chancellors are going to make those difficult decisions early in Parliament. So Geoffrey Howe famously did it in his 1981 budget. Uh, Lamont and Clark both did it in, in 93, and obviously George Osborne did it in 2010 and raised VAT in, in 2010. And in lots of those cases, and most, most famously Howe's budget in 81, you had strong opposition from economists saying this is the wrong time to consolidate, it's the wrong time in the cycle, but ultimately the politics won out. And again, I think this time the economics, I think, may tell you to wait the politics might tell you to go a bit sooner. Then on the scale of, of, of the consolidation, I think this will be very different to 2010. And I think this time the politics will actually act to limit the extent of any consolidation. So under Osborne and Cameron, deficit reduction was, was the centerpiece of their economic strategy. It was a very clear dividing line with Labour and they argued very successfully and rightly or wrongly, but they were very successful at doing this. They said Labour were the ones who got us into this mess responsible for the big increase in borrowing and the Tories will get you out of it. This time, of course, is very different. The crisis has happened on the Tories' watch. Uh, and unlike in 2010, which followed a long period of uh, increasing public spending, this consolidation is going to come on hot on the heels uh, of a decade of spending restraint. So I think deficit reduction is not going to be the wedge political issue it was a decade ago. And that will mean that the Tories try to get away with as limited a consolidation as possible and they will be looking for arguments as to why they can be more dovish you know, and they will be very focused on the idea that interest rates will be very low and that, therefore that gives them more flexibility and then finally on the nature of, of any consolidation again as touched on before but the public was already very weary of spending restraint before the crisis and the, and the vital role the NHS has played in this crisis as well as, as the kind of broader welfare system in, in supporting people I think will only have reinforced that so tax rises is going to have to shoulder much more of the burden than it did post-2010. I don't think that means that there are going to be absolutely no spending cuts at all, but I think tax rises will have a much bigger role to play. So all of this is to say that I think the politics are going to be crucial to how any fiscal consolidation plays out short and long term. 
but also that they are completely different to what they were a decade ago. I think lots of people are gearing up to have those fights again, and I, I just don't think they will, they will happen, other than perhaps on, on the timing of the consolidation, as I say, where I think there is a conflict between the politics and, and, and the economics, potentially. Back to you, Ian. Thanks, David. That's great. Um, on the politics, I wondered if you could um, say a bit more about that, uh, the, the, the political pressure to consolidate. I mean, you know, compared to the other thing we had in 2010 was obviously much higher government borrowing costs as well. Um, and in this world of extraordinarily low uh, borrowing costs, it seems to sharpen that dilemma where you know, it's, it's really of no consequence for an existing within a parliament to borrow as much as you like. Um, and making the uh, arguments about uh, the unsustainability of it just, just don't, seem to, don't seem to fly at all, which seems to really exacerbate the risk that we lay the seeds for future problems that might only emerge in 20 years time. Um, so is, is that a significant factor that, make, that also adds into your analysis of why there is less pressure to, to, or less political will perhaps to, to, to consolidate this time than there would have been last 10 years ago. Yeah, and I, and I think that is why um, the fiscal rules are so important because politicians will spend as much as you allow them to spend, right? You have to create a framework and particularly number 10, right? The, the dynamic between number 10 and number 11 will be number 10 will spend as much as you will let them spend. And that is why the treasury and the chancellor will be very clear and very keen to have a fiscal rule that, that provides constraint. And that's why one of the, you know, the absolutely key debate that will happen over the next six months will be around that fiscal framework and that long-term fiscal framework. And, 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 num and number 10 will push for that to be as loose as possible. And, and the Treasury will push back and try and make that as tight as possible because the inevitability is that all of, all of the flexibility provided, all of the headroom will get, will, 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 will get spent. So I think that is, that is the, the key from a Treasury perspective, that is the key to debate. The debate to have to really frame what, what those fiscal rules are to provide constraints on, on politicians effectively. Okay, great. Let's take a few uh, questions. Uh, Graham, uh, Graham Lister. Graham, you've got a question about uh, the household debts and business debts as well. Do you want to uh, ask your question? Yes. Um, you've been talking about uh, public sector debt but what about business debt and household debt these have also been extraordinarily high so uh, the total GDP uh, debt to GDP is going to be over 300 percent that's surely going to affect the economy and an economy that we're going to leave to our grandchildren with a huge debt and a huge amount to pay to recover the um, climate. Okay, uh, great. And Francis, if I come to you, Francis Copper, if I come to you next. Hi. Um, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can also hear bird song, Francis. It's yes, I'm in the garden. <laughs> Ain't locked, isn't lockdown great? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I, there, were, there was quite a lot of discussion about interest rate rises, but no discussion of inflation, and yet surely the two are linked. So what would be the inflationary pressures in the future, do you think, that would cause interest rates to rise sharply and make the debt path unsustainable? Okay, great. And then um, Jose Borges. Uh, so Jose is asking, what's the impact of Brexit here? Um, I guess there's a, few, there's a few different channels we might consider. So I guess what we have there is a set of questions that all revolve around uh, essentially risks to the outlook uh, of various types from inflation, the broader uh, business and household sector debt level and from uh, Brexit. Um, Vicky, do you want to kick off on, on those? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Well, on, on Francis's point, uh, of course, she's quite right. I mean, the, the truth is that right now we, the fear is more of deflation rather than inflation but the problem with that is that we can't wish the debt away through higher inflation so it's going to have to be growth uh, the reason why interest rates might um, rise i think it's unlikely certainly in the in the short to medium term because the uk is certainly perceived as a safe country is if there is a serious concern that growth in the world economy is just not going to resume at any serious level 
uh, of the type that we used to see and we still even you know before this crisis we hadn't gone back to where we were before the previous crisis and in fact we were heading downwards in terms of uh, trade growth um, and if that is to happen and given the extra sovereign debt that a number of countries have had to take there's a serious issue uh, about many countries defaulting we've already seen what the IMF has done and the World Bank and the, the Paris Club and they in terms of delaying or postponing or cancelling debt repayments by many countries and possibly needing to restructure the debt. So I think the markets may start getting a little bit worried, but by comparison, the UK, the US and others might look okay. So interest rates are likely to stay reasonably low. Um, so the, the chances are that indeed rates will, will remain quite low and therefore it isn't going to be a, a serious issue, but unfortunately we're going to have to get the growth up. And, and it is really mainly if growth doesn't resume that markets will start getting seriously worried or the central banks run out of ammunition. Uh, on Brexit, obviously, it reduces growth uh, quite considerably. All the forecasts before whether that would be the case, we've already seen that happening. Uh, it affects, of course, many additional sectors are the ones already affected by COVID uh, and some of the, the impact on trade and then on growth in those areas uh, will just exacerbate the problems. So that's why I'm pessimistic, both about growth and about uh, public finances. And in terms of private sector debt, absolutely spot on. That is a big, big issue. Uh, the consumer, not so much. I worry less about the consumer. As you know, the consumer is beginning to repay debt. And right now they have lots of savings, which they haven't spent because everything's been closed practically. Uh, at least the ones who have managed to keep their jobs and got something out of the furlough scheme, quite a lot of others haven't. And so that's the concern about inequality that I mentioned. But yes, businesses, it's a serious issue. Um, uh, the reason why um, quite a lot did not take uh, part in all the schemes that are available for the government is because they fear that they're not going to have the ability to repay that debt uh, if there is indeed no demand for their products in their sectors. And that's a serious, serious issue. Even those that have borrowed is pro are probably going to be looking again, at possibly at the government to deal with a situation where they can't repay. Uh, those loans. And there are all sorts of discussions now about how the government can, can take a bigger share, convert loans into equity, and so on. So yes, there's a debate to be had, and it's one that is definitely going to cast a shadow over the growth prospects of the economy. Okay, great. Uh, Linda, how about from your perspective? Uh, thanks very much. I think in terms of um, private sector debt, I think one thing perhaps just to add is that if private sector debt begins to change the market for loans, in other words, the cost of borrowing, um, because obviously that debt also is part of the overall debt um, of, the, of the economy, um, then that is obviously something that um, adds even more concern to having very high levels of um, household, um, particularly um, uh, household debt as well as corporate debt. Um, I think in terms of inflationary pressures and Francis's question, um, the, there is a lively debate about whether or not um, we are going to have uh, inflation as a result of the extraordinary monetary policy right now um, and the underlying deflationary pressures from the collapsing economic activity. And I suppose over the long term, um, the assumption by the OBR and is yeah, is that there will be 2% inflation. Um, and that's where I think the 1.5% borrowing cost comes from. It's extracted from the guilt yields. Um, and I would say it's one of the, it is one of the difficult issues to determine because inflation over a longer term will depend on the growth rate. It's going to depend on the level of fiscal spending, the size of the fiscal deficit. And so there is, I think, quite a lot of, um, uh, uh, uncertainty there um, as well, which is why I think if you look at the real cost of borrowing, if there was any way of locking um, that in over the longer term, um, then then I think that would at least give a little bit of a little bit more certainty around the cost of at least investing in physical and human capital. Um, and I, you know, and just one more thing to add on the impact of Brexit, I think the you know, the frictions around, um, again, uncertainty. Um, I think that's going to, you know, be another factor to look for if we don't end up with some type of trade agreement about the future relationship um, at the end of this month. Um, and with all of the pandemic's effects, uncertainty is really affecting investment. And investment, as we've been saying, is one of the keys 
um, to growth. So I think having some certainty in anywhere, <laughs> anywhere, in any aspect would be welcome. Great, thanks Linda. Tim, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I mean, I agree, agree with much of what um, Linda and, and Vicky said. I think on, on business debt, it's a very big problem. The Treasury are very focused on this. Uh, now there's a real danger that it holds holds back the recovery. And I, mean, I think one of the key questions will be how long the crisis goes on, on for and how quickly we can get to a kind of go back to full normal rather than this interim new normal. Um, I think that, that will be really important. I mean, if you think the, the whole logic when the Treasury started off with all these loan schemes pumping all this debt in was, was the idea that you'd have a very quick recovery. So businesses would take on some more debt, but in three months' time, you'd be back to normal. And that now doesn't look like it's going to be the case. So I think this is much more of a problem than we would have uh, envisaged back in March when, when, when this started. So, um, and, but I think that they're definitely going to have to look at some kind of recapitalization you know, uh, uh, institutional or, or policy solution. Um, in, in terms of inflation and, and, and interest rates, you know, the, only, the only thing I'd add is that um, you, you, you need rate, rates to be low for a really long time for debt, not for, the, for these debt problems not to be an issue, right? We're talking not, not 10 years, but you know, if you look at the long-term projections for debt, this is a problem for 40 years. So you know, you've really got to be banking on low rates for a really long time to say, uh, this is is not a problem, and also even if you you know even if you think they're not going to be a problem for a while, you have to plan for your tail risk. You know, the, the last decade has taught us anything that you know shocks come along, and you can't predict with any certainty what's going to happen to the economy. Uh, and then, and then on Brexit, you know, I think, uh, and this links into Vicky's point on 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 the importance of growth. Um, the you know the one of the kind of uh, strengths of the UK economy uh, historically has been its. Uh, the, the certainty, the, the, the stability of the environment in the UK, it's made it a very investable proposition. And I think two things have weighed very heavily on that over the last five years. One has been the uncertainty around Brexit. The other was the uncertainty around a, a, a Corbyn government speaking to businesses in the Treasury. Uh, those were the two issues they would raise time, again, time and again. One of those has obviously been taken off the table. I think certainty on Brexit, and, and I don't mean bad certainty, I mean good certainty on Brexit with a, with a, with a the kind of best possible deal that we can get given where we are, um, I think I think will be hugely helpful um, in, in, in terms of our growth prospects. Okay, great. Um, let's, uh, Sam Alvis, if, Sam, if I come to you, let's, let's go to the politics, uh, talk a bit more about the politics of this. Um, Sam, if I uh, unmute you, you should be able to talk now. Can you hear me? Great. Um, so we've talked a bit about what the Tory line will be, um, perhaps looking to be more dovish, but I'm wondering whether the panel think the opposition will come from in terms of debt, what Labour's line might be, what the pressure from outside of Parliament might be on the Tories to either keep the size of the debt or to double down. Okay, great. And then let's also, uh, Christina, if I, Christina Powell, if I come to you, you've got a question on the short term, on the, on the government's plans and levelling up. Okay, I just wanted to ask Tim, um, obviously this question depends on what fiscal framework gets decided eventually, but as the fiscal headroom is shrinking, a lot of the quite generous high investment spending promises that were made um, might have to give, obviously at the political cost of not, not servicing a really, really big promise made to some parts of the country. So do you, do you think these electoral promises are going to give, and if not, at, at what cost, I guess? Okay, let's go with that uh, set of political questions. Tim, do you want to kick us off on that? Yes, yeah, so I, I didn't hear Christina's fully. Was, was she saying to what, to what extent are the existing kind of commitments around levelling up going to be kind of uh, st uh, stuck to going forward? Yeah, Christina, I don't know if you want to come back in, yeah. but broadly it's that, the impact on the short term, you know, the election winning pledges and all the rest. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, I, I, I think that the... the Tories will be very, very keen to honour as many of those manifesto commitments as, as, as possible. And I think in two key areas, so levelling up and, and net zero as well, they will link the recovery as much as possible back to those uh, agendas. And I think the, 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 the early evidence is in terms of the regional impact of, of this crisis that they, they may actually exacerbate the existing regional inequalities. So it, it makes the the requirement to tackle, which was already there from a political perspective, which was, was, was the whole levelling up agenda, I think it will only kind of reinforce that need. And I think they will pitch it very differently to the way the kind of recovery was pitched a, a decade ago. You've already seen it. This is going to be an investment-led uh, 
recovery, they are going to double down on infrastructure spending. I think they'll do the same on R&D spending. So I think they, they will definitely see the levelling up agenda as you, you may see it framed differently. It will now be formed part of a, a limb of the kind of whole economic recovery strategy. But I think for political reasons and for economic reasons, it will stay uh, a, a, a kind of central plank of, of the focus. Then, I mean, on, on, on labour, I think it is a really interesting question. And I think you will just see much uh, less political space between the Labour Party and the Tory Party on economic policy uh, going forward than we have seen over the last decade and obviously particularly uh, in, in the last five years where the dividing line has been really pretty pretty stark. I mean that's a mixture of Labour I think coming back from a, from a you know, very left-wing uh, e e uh, economic strategy under McDonald coming back towards the centre but also the reality is that the Tories have shifted quite far on economic policy and, and specifically on fiscal policy um, over the last since, since George Osborne left, and, and, and a lot of that has been accepting this idea that low interest rates mean that you can and should indeed borrow quite significant amounts to 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 spend on capital. That was obviously something that McDonald was hanging on about, and the Tories opposed, you know, pretty strongly for the first couple of years that he was in charge. So I think that the I think you will see a lot less space on on fiscal policy between Labour and between the Conservatives than we have over the last decade, and and it will be much less of a kind of talked about political dividing line. Sorry, I'm on mute. Linda, how about you? What do you uh, think on the politics here? Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, I think uh, just a couple of points to add. Um, I think the, um, the difference between uh, the opposition parties, you specifically Labour um, and the Tories, I think they're it is going to be much less. In fact, I do remember there used to be a borrow to invest rule under Labour Chancellor. <laughs> Feels like a long time ago. Um, but I think, you know, the, um, the, the size, the public, the view on the public debt size, I don't necessarily think there's going to be space um, uh, between the two major parties um, on Sam's question. But I think the question is, what is the level of public debt um, that we're working a sustainability rule to? And I think it's something that James touches on in his report. So um, start going into this crisis. Debt levels are very high. Um, they were way north of the old levels of debt, even the Maastricht Treaty of 60% of GDP. And we're now above 100%. So what is that new level? And I think that will, gen that will um, lead to debate um, between the parties as well as, as really um, as between all of us. And um, I would probably um, you know, say that we wouldn't expect, um, this is something that economists currently seem to agree on, so I'm sure this consensus will not hold for very long, um, is that there's absolutely no, um, no focus on the level of debt now in the short term because you're trying to get through the pandemic. But as we are talking about the longer term fiscal framework, I think that is one of the questions that needs to be debated and answered because um, you can achieve this in various ways and the better, um, but you know, we, I think we need to be very frank about the fact that there is not necessarily one uh, level of debt uh, that is uh, hugely apparent at this point. Um, and I think that is something just to, to bear in mind because sometimes, um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the market view will be different from the policy view, from the popular view. So that leads me to a quick answer to the second question, which is, yeah, I think it's about to time to change the framework. <laughs> so thank you to Christina for the question. <laughs> and that's indeed what, um, uh, you know, so great about being here today and um, discussing this report is that um, the framework for it to be, um, to be consistent with a policy of investment led growth, the fiscal framework needs to be um, able to support that. So again, it's about giving everyone certainty, um, whether it's markets or investors or businesses or the general public, about why it is investment is being undertaken. How does this slot into the overall fiscal and growth framework? And I think it is about thinking about the rules that would enable us uh, to grow. Because I've long been of the view the 21st century world economy is very different um, than, the, uh, than the past um, uh, decades. And it is about trying to uh, rethink old policies and making sure that uh, we're not stuck um, 
you know, somehow um, with what worked before, because what is clear is, um, you know, this is a very different time. Um, and then you have the pandemic and everything else. So yes, I think it's time to rethink the framework. Okay, great. And Vicky? Yes, on, on uh, Sam's question, um, I think it's going to be a, a, an issue between different factions within the Tory party rather than the two parties uh, disagreeing with each other. And I agree with what was said before on this. But also, I think more importantly, the, the, the Treasury ideology of old. So the Treasury bean counters will take over at some point uh, and will worry hugely about uh, where the spending is going. And also, at some point, the NAO, the National Audit Office, is going to start and the Public Accounts Committee start trying to see what, where has all this money gone and has it actually had any impact. And that links with the levelling up uh, agenda that uh, Christina was talking about and uh, Tim covered uh, as well, which is that it is going to be harder to do that levelling up. I mean, the regions are, are affected in different ways. And of course, if you throw Brexit on it, then you see that, the, the, that they have been affected very negatively and will continue to do so to, to a, a degree that is going to require an awful lot of fixing to be done. And of course, at the same time, uh, you know, you can't ignore London because it has been the sort of golden goose uh, distributing money around. So that's a big issue. So how much levelling up do you do? And where I worry uh, is that on what basis any of these things will happen. Uh, the government has been talking, you know, without worrying too much about sort of mentioning things like uh, we're going to redo the green, the Treasury Green Book, and we're going to be spending money not worrying about whether it has the biggest impact uh, in order to help the regions. Yes, well, that's fine. But a lot of money, A, can be wasted, and B, uh, I think a lot of money won't know where to go if we're really going to be pushing what we're talking about, the green economy. Nobody knows what it actually means. Nobody knows how many jobs will be created. Nobody knows whether it's short term or long term and even infrastructure projects. Are we going to start rethinking between HS2 and something which is going to take a long time and won't have an impact for ages and ages? Or are we going to ditch that and think of something more uh, you know, down to earth, such as skills uh, or local uh, links? So that requires a serious spending review. And uh, so far, we haven't had it. So we're talking in the dark, really, as to what any of these policies might mean. Okay, thank you very much, Vicky. Now, I was going to come to the panel with one last question about um, the uh, distributional uh, consequences of all this, um, because there's a couple of questions in the Q&A. But uh, given that we are on the hour, I will spare you that uh, almost impossible question to answer, but leave you with the thought that uh, obviously over the, uh, hopefully our report today is, a, is uh, you know, at the, start, at the start really of what's going to be a very big uh, debate over the next decade about how we manage this situation and I think distribution implications of it and consequences of different ways of tackling it are going to be at the heart of our politics uh, for uh, at least the rest of uh, the decade. Um, so thank you all so much for joining. Thank you to Vicky, to Linda, and to Tim and to James uh, for uh, kicking off that debate this morning. Uh, do have a read of the report and share it and uh, uh, that's all uh, from us. I hope you all have a good day. Thank you very much.